Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day to come together and worship, pray, fellowship, and the freedom with which we have to do these things. We have uh, two Ask the Pastor questions today. Um, the first one is, what is the meaning of the last shall be first and the first shall be last? Um, I, uh, there's a couple meanings that are very plain, uh, but there's one meaning that I think Jesus is sp speaking to on a different level, and I'll, I'll address that in a minute. The first one is, I think Jesus is establishing for his people God's economy of things. Okay, that um, there are those who are considered great in this life who have had success, they've had wealth, they've had prosperity, and in the kingdom of God, because of the, the blessings that they've had, they've not returned unto him, they will be last in the kingdom of God. There are those who have given up much to serve him, and they will be held um, very high in esteem in the kingdom of God. Man, I'm blowing my papers around. Um, I think also um, that Jesus is establishing a model that he, he lived out and he gave to his disciples for leadership. That in order to lead, you have to serve. Okay? And that's completely backwards to the way that the world looks at things. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you want to be a good leader, learn to be a good server. That's the only way that you serve in the body of Christ, by, by, by serving. That's the only way you can lead, is to serve. Uh, but I have a, another suspicion that I think Jesus was getting at, and I think this is borne out in other passages in the New Testament. I, I think Peter or uh, Jesus is speaking to the Jews... And he's laying out this understanding that the gospel was given to the Jews first. They're first. God chose them out of all the people of the earth first to be his own possession. But, Romans 10 tells us that for a time, their hearts have become hardened. Why? Well, Romans tells us it's so that the Gentiles might be receivers of the mercy that God has poured out. So, the last... The Gentiles will be first. They receive the promise first. And then the first will be last because there will come a time, the time of the end of the Gentiles, okay? The, the end of the time of the Gentiles. Let me re rephrase that. And then God will move on his people once again and they will receive the mercy that we are receiving now. So... Um, I will leave this up here. There are a couple of scripture passages that I cited in that. Um, second passage, um, by the way, the, the scripture passages that that context is drawn out of um, Matthew 19 and 20 and then Romans 10. So uh, if you're looking for further information. Uh, next question is, Matthew 6.22 says um, that the eye is the lamp of the body, etc. What does this mean? Um, Again, I think Jesus is speaking to several different issues. I think that first, um, he's saying, you know, if, if the eye is good, then the body will be good. And if the eye is bad, the body will be bad. I think he's, you know, what are you paying attention to? What are you looking at? What are you putting in front of your face? Um, I think that's pretty the obvious conclusion there is, you know, guide them. That's a computer term for garbage in, garbage out. If you put bad code into your, your program, you're gonna get garbage. So the same thing holds true with our bodies. You're taking garbage in, garbage is what's gonna come out. You fill up a sponge, you wanna know what's in it, you squeeze it. And whatever went into it is what comes out of it. Okay, but I think beyond this, because this passage that Jesus is, is talking about, um, or that, that the question's talking about in Matthew 6, right before it, it talks about where your treasure is, your heart is. And right after it, it talks about um, you cannot serve God and mammon. So I think specifically in this instance, what he is talking about is 
Are you looking at the things that this world has to offer and that's your pursuit, that's your desire, that's your um, lust? Or are you willing to set those things aside and look to eternity? What are you putting in front of your face? Because if you're looking to this life, when you get to the end of this life, that's it, it's done. So if that's all you're looking for, live it up now. Because you have eternity with nothing. But should you choose to look to eternity and set those things in front of you, the model that Christ has given us, then you have rewards forever. Okay? So I, I think it's moving on two planes. I think that the plain meaning is what you put in front of your face is what goes in. And what goes in is what comes out. But I think in context, it has to do with specifically... Um, are you looking after, you know, mammon just means, most translations say money, but, but really it's the idea of possessions, what you've got. You know, are you competing with the Joneses? You know, oh, the Joneses got a new car, I have to go get a new car. Oh, the Joneses got a 48 inch flat screen, I need to get a 50. Um, oh, wouldn't it be nice, you know, I, I've talked about this before. How many TVs can you watch at one time? <laughs> you know? Um, it's amazing to me. Um, there, for a time, we had like six TVs in our house. We don't even have an antenna. <laughs> what do we need that many TVs for? So, you know, what are you putting in front of your eyes? Are you looking for the things of God, or are you looking for the material things, the possessions, the, the money things? So I will leave both of these up here. Feel free to come get them. I'll put some other passages of Scripture to reference in there. Um... We, uh, last week we wrapped up spiritual warfare, and, and really I, I feel kind of bad saying we wrapped it up because really we only scratched the surface of it. Okay, we just barely got into what Scripture has to say about spiritual warfare. Um, I have a, a series that we're going to start. Um, I'm not sure when we're going to start it. I, I'm not sure. Um, but I have something that God has been dealing with me about for actually several years. And I want to kind of lay this before you. So first thing I want you to do, um, I want you to take your bulletin, I want you to flip it over to the back, and I want you to answer a very simple question. I want you to answer it honestly. If you need a bulletin, put your hand up, we'll get you something to write on. Uh, Josh, could you hand out if anybody, anybody need a bulletin? We need a couple over here. One over here. Mary Lou needs one. Tim needs one. Scott Edmund in the back needs one. Everybody else got one? Okay, I want you to answer this question honestly. You're not, I'm not going to have you give them to me. I'm not going to have you show your neighbor or, you know, pass them over to the right. And we're not going to do any of that. So I want you to be honest in this. Okay? And we're going to take a minute, I want you to ponder, and then I want you to write your answer down. Some of you might have multiple answers. Some of you might have one or two. Um, the question is, why are you not inviting people to church? Specifically, specifically, non-believers or non-attending believers. We all know people that profess to be believers, but oh yeah, you know, I just, church is full of hypocrites, and well, that'd be a great place for you. Okay? Why are you not inviting those people to church? And I'm not even speaking specifically to our church. I'm just speaking generally. Why are you not inviting them to church? Okay? So write that down. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Okay, and I'll give you just a, a minute more here to, to write that out. <clears throat> so, one of the questions that I pray about quite a bit is 
as a fellowship, as a body, as a church, what is Jesus Community Church to be about? Okay. What are we supposed to be doing? Okay. And the one thing that God has spoken to me over and over and over and over again, and I'm, I'm going to lay it to you, and then I'm going to kind of try and explain what he's, he's speaking to me. He says, internal, external. Inside, outside. Okay? Internal, external, inside, outside. And the process is, is simply this. Okay? We work to build the church individually inside. We build each other up. We teach. We pray. We worship. We do these things to build ourselves up so that. See, that's not the end. All too often, that's what we look at church as. That's the end. I come to church to get built up. I want a pat on the back. I want to feel good about myself. Okay? And that's where it is. But the understanding that I have from New Testament, specifically, but throughout Scripture, is that we get built up so that we can go out and bring that light to them. So internal, external. But that's not it either. Because, see, the idea is we go out there and grab them and bring them in here. Okay? Such that goats come in, sheep go out. Okay? So they come in and they receive what we have been receiving so that they, too, can go out. Okay? So the idea in, in all of this, the, the, the scripture that really drives this for me, and we're going to go back and I'm going to, I've got a lot of scriptures that we're going to hit on today. If you fall behind, don't get all the notes, don't worry about it, come talk to me. I'll make a copy of this. Okay? Um, Matthew 13, turn there with me if you would. Matthew chapter 13. So, I'm going to pick up in verse 3. Jesus is speaking to a crowd. So, Matthew 13, picking up in verse 3. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them out. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, we're going to skip down, because... Jesus is speaking in parables, and the disciples know, why, why do you want to speak in parables? Well, so that those who can hear will hear and understand, all right? And we're going to jump down because Jesus explains what this parable is supposed to be about. Now, we've all heard this, but we're just stick with me, okay? Um, verse 18, so we jump down to verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. This is his explanation. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, 
But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Okay? Now, you'll notice the first thing right off the bat is the word has to be what? Sown. Sown. It's got to be put out there and we don't get to judge who will receive it and who doesn't. That's, that's not our job. Our job is to get the word out. Okay? So we have got to be going. And we're going to come back to this parable but the idea here is we go, they come in, that's the crop, the bountiful crop, 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold. They grow up, and what should they then do? Grow up, sow more seed, and then they're going to reproduce, right? Okay, they're going to produce more. Now, I, I don't know a lot about gardening. As a matter of fact, I know I don't garden, Okay. But evidently, they've got seeds that, you know, you plant them in the ground, they'll grow up, they'll produce some fruit, and you take those seeds and put them in the ground, and they don't do anything. <laughs> Purposely sterilizing food. Am I the only one that that makes no sense to? Okay, that to me is just asinine. So, this, this parable is what is driving this message. Okay? So, let's back up. Internal. <clears throat> These are the pillars. These are the things that I see and I believe God is, is directing this church to do internally. Okay? We are building up the body through teaching and preaching. Okay? We come together to hear the word. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Colossians 3, 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness, in your hearts to God. Okay? So one of the pillars in this church that we need to build on is teaching. Preaching the word, teaching the word. And as a result, it's not just one direction. It's Because I can stand up here and preach 150 sermons. But until you learn it, I'm just the wind. I'm battling. Blah, 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 blah. I know, I know. You think I do that already. That's okay. Okay? But the idea is it's not just teaching, it's learning, it's receiving. Okay? Um, taking the word, finding the application, applying it to your life, and living it out. All right? So, point, and these are in, in no particular order. I'm not saying this is the priority, I'm just saying these are the pillars. Second pillar, we build up the body through fellowship, okay? I'm not talking about cookies and coffee, although that's part of it. It's just a small part, okay? And if cookies and coffee is your idea of fellowship, you're only getting a small part of what fellowship really is. Um, so what is, what is fellowship? It's a partnership to the mutual benefit of those involved. Okay, so since we are Christians, it's what will benefit us mutually. All of us together, okay? So it benefits me, it benefits you. So as such, Acts chapter two, um, this is what I think the, the early church was founded on. I think this is a model that we need to be looking at for our own church everywhere. All right? 
So Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47 it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Okay, there's your coffee and, and cookies. The breaking of bread, they're eating together. All right? And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, now right there, all of the things that I'm looking for are contained right in that passage. All right? They had fellowship. They had prayer. They had teaching. They got now... Folks, we got to break this American mentality of the seven and a half minute attention span. Okay? We got to break the American mentality of a two hour movie attention span. We need to understand that driving our lives as Christians is Christ, and He comes first. You notice how often they got together? Day by day. Day by day. Now, I understand our culture is very different. Okay? We have a 40 plus hour week jobs. Some of us can't make it to church every Sunday. Much less every day. Goodness. We have problems making it to church and to prayer meeting or Bible study or whatever. That's Americanism at its finest, folks. That's not godly. That is us settling for a cultural idea. Okay? John 17, Jesus is speaking. He says, I do not ask for these only. He says, not just for these disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, this is the idea of fellowship, okay? Would you say Jesus had fellowship with the Father? Absolutely. Would you say Jesus had fellowship with the disciples? Well, that was not nearly as emphatic. Three and a half years together. Would you say Jesus had fellowship with the disciples? Yes. Okay. Would you say the disciples had fellowship with Jesus? Okay. Well, they spent the same three and a half years with him that he spent with them. And you were a whole lot less enthusiastic about that. Does Jesus want fellowship with you? Yes. Absolutely. Do you want fellowship with him? Yes. Okay. Now, one thing to note, in that three and a half years, not only were the disciples with Jesus, but they were with each other. Did you notice that? Okay. As a matter of fact, when he sent them out, how did he send them out? Two by two. Not one by one. Okay. He sent them out cooperatively. Okay. This is the idea of fellowship that I'm looking at. All right. That we are knitted together. One body made up of many parts. All right? Uh, 1 John 1, 3. Uh, this is John speaking. He says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaimed also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. See here? This is exactly what I'm talking about. We have fellowship with God. We have the Father. Fellowship with His Son. But we have fellowship with each other based on what principle. Well, that we have the same understanding. Okay? Now, this is something you need to get deep in your heart. You cannot and should not ever have fellowship with the world. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you don't have relationship with them. Okay? I'm saying you can't have fellowship not the same way that you are supposed to in the church. Well, man, I, I have some really good friends that aren't saved. Good, get them saved. 
I'm not saying forsake friendship. What I'm saying is that the fellowship that you have in the church should be in every way dynamically different than the fellowship you have with the world. Um, Paul is writing, he says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Who's the temple of God? We are. For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst, their midst being the world, the lawless, and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Okay? So, this, this whole understanding, well, gosh, that means I, I wouldn't, you know, get to do beer night with the guys. Hey, look, God doesn't have a problem with beer night with the guys. As long as your understanding is you are of the light and they are of the dark and you are trying to get them from the dark to the light. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. If your idea is that, hey, I'm just going to go hang with the guys and drink some beer, you've completely misunderstood the fact that he has saved you out of something and made you a new creation that is nothing in any way resembling what they are. He has delivered you from that. He has set you free from it. That's dead. I don't know how many of you want to dig out. We had a dog. Uh, best dog I've ever had in my life. And he died very young. I only, I only got to be with him a little over three years. And he was the best dog I ever had. I will probably never get another dog. But when he died... In spite of all the good memories I had with him, he got buried. I didn't drag him around with me. I didn't hook up the leash and haul him behind me. He was dead. It was gone. It was done. I look back on those memories, but I don't carry the dog with me. Okay? A lot of us are trying to carry that old dead man around with us. Mm -hmm. He's got to go. Got to go. Okay? Well, how then are we supposed to minister to them? He says, come out and be separate in that you are not the same anymore. But we go out there taking the light to them. Exposing them to the light. Don't shudder your light and go back amongst them and look like the dark. Okay? Be light. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you understand that? Okay? Where are your priorities? What have you established in your life as the order of priorities in the things you do? Not the things you think, the things you do. Okay? Because that reveals your heart. And if you are more interested in being loved and accepted by the world than loved and accepted by the Father, you're in trouble. Because before the world, you are denying Him, either by commission, I don't know this Jesus you're talking about. No, man, I went to church once. My wife drugged me. Never again, man. Bible? Oh, it was, um, actually, it was, it was my wife's. Or, by omission. I never knew you were a Christian. So you see, you can deny him without ever doing anything. And if you are out in the world and people do not know that you are his, you've denied him. Okay? So fellowship, being knitted together, 
being apart from this world. Yeah, we take our light out to the world, but we don't belong to them anymore. We shouldn't look, act, or smell like them. <coughs> we are unique. God has called us out to be a separate nation. Another pillar, worship. Worship. When Jesus rebuked the devil, he actually quoted this passage. Matthew 4.10, he says, Then Jesus said to him, the devil, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Worship. Do you understand we were created to worship? Do you understand that? Why? Because God is worthy of worship. That should be our natural response, is to worship Him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay? Look, God rejected cruddy sacrifices in the Old Testament. The sacrifice had to be perfect. Quit bringing crud to the sacrifice. Okay? You have the righteousness of God in Christ. Don't dress up in the filthy rags you wore before. Come to him and worship him, but do so like this. You present your bodies to him. You, you don't conform to this world anymore. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind, making it new. By the way, all this is done not of your own strength. It's because of God's great mercy. Okay, so, so you're sweating going, oh man, I have got so much work to do. God has got it. Okay, get out of his way and let him do it. Okay? If the things in your life are a big pin, move. Okay? Well, this is all I've known my entire life. Move. You don't have to live in the pig pen. The gate's been open. Jesus tore down all the walls. The only thing keeping you in the pig pen is you. Move. So, teaching, fellowship, worship, prayer. Folks, I cannot stress to you enough how important prayer is, individually and collectively, corporately, okay? When Jesus cleaned out the temple, why did he clean out the temple? Were they irritating him? Was he annoyed with the smell of the goats and the sheep and the, the doves? He didn't like the particular brand of money they were, he didn't like the money. What, what bothered him? What was this temple supposed to be? What had God said this temple was going to be? A house of prayer. Look, if you're having struggles in your Christian walk, pray. If you're struggling to find victory in your life, pray. Make prayer something that is ongoing in your life. Set aside time. You guys do it how you want. I do it first thing in the morning, okay? Because I want to set my tone right then. Mm -hmm. And there are many days I get up in the morning and I... Uh, and I don't drink coffee, so I don't even have that to go to. Okay? Stupid coffee. I wish it tastes good. Yeah. What, so I go and I sit down, I get in the Word, I listen to worship, and I start praying. Okay? And I pray. And I'll tell you what, 90% of the time, by the time I get up, that grumbling attitude, that ee edgy, is gone. Okay? I'm still working on the 10%. I'm trying to get out of God's way so he can clear that out. Mm -hmm. All right? Pray. Make a habit of setting aside. Get alone. Have a designated spot to pray. Okay? Jesus says, go to your inner room. You don't need to make it where people can see you. Okay? Pray, but um, don't just stop there. We just read Acts 2, 42. It says, and they devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Are you devoted to praying? And the idea, this in context, is not the individual prayer that we're talking about in your room. This is corporate prayer. This is coming together to pray. Oh, Pastor, I, I don't pray, pray very well. Neither do I. Okay? I, I simply lay out before God what's on my heart and my mind. And sometimes I'm, I'm pretty blunt. You, you don't think God knows that? You don't think God knows what's already in my heart? Mm -hmm. God, I, I don't understand what you're doing here. This looks stupid to me. Give me your insight or take it away. God can handle your prayers, your honesty. Now, be careful that you don't get to the point where you are blaspheming, where you are insulting your injuries to God. You're, you're declaring him to be things that he is not. Okay? Because the problem is not with him. The problem is with you. Always remember that. The problem is with you. Something is impeding you, not him. Okay? So... Uh, Colossians 4.2 Continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. First Thessalonians 5 verse 16 through 18 says Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It, it's amazing to me how often Thanksgiving is tied into all of these things. Um, how often are we to rejoice? Always. Okay. Do you rejoice always? I don't. There's a, there's a lot of times I, I don't. Okay. Um, pray without ceasing. Now, we, I've talked to you about your individual prayer time in your closet. We've talked about corporate prayer coming together as a body. But, but you know praying is an ongoing thing. Okay. It's ongoing. Okay? There are times when God will speak to you and have you pray something in the moment. He'll just bring something up to your mind. You don't need to slam the car in park and run over to the park bench and hit your knees. Okay? Especially not in front of a police officer. They don't like it. Okay? Take your time. Offer it up in prayer. Go on about your business. Paul actually writes to one of the churches. He says, as often as I remember you, I pray for you. As it comes to mind, pray for it. Pray about it. Okay? Prayer. Folks, this has got to be the engine that drives the spiritual working of this church. Okay? Pray consistently. Uh, I told you a while back we went to Manhattan and visited Christopher and Kayla's church out there. And their church is a bit bigger than ours, not a whole lot, but bigger. And we went um, over a Wednesday when we have prayer meeting here. And, you know, I, I get frustrated because we only have 12 or 13 people show up. Okay? Um, you know, we're all on this boat together. The more people we have rowing, the faster the boat gets where it's going. Okay? We need people getting on the boat, not just to sit and enjoy the day and make fun of the people that are rowing. We need everybody rowing and pulling together. All right? Folks, I know some of you have jobs that take you away on Wednesday night. I know some of you have things that, that really occupy. But I'll tell you what, if, if it's your television that's occupying you on a Wednesday night, shame on you. Shame on you. Okay? Take that time. Come to prayer. Pray. You don't have to pray out loud. Matter of fact, um, we probably only have about half of the people that consistently pray out loud. Pray as God leads you. Pray quietly in your spirit. That's okay. But be together with the body praying together for the same things. Okay? Um, so, praying without ceasing. As you're going throughout the day and God brings to memory, pray. Now, what is praying? You don't, you don't have to speak King James to pray. That's just talking to God. I talk to God just like I talk to you guys. God, God tells me jokes. He points things out to me that make me laugh. All the time. 
He shows things to me. You know, I've got a brain that's always going. And I, I get to the point where I don't like when Christy asks me, what are you thinking? Because I think really weird things like, how did they know there was no oxygen in outer space when they sent the animals up? Well, because they came back dead. That's hard on the animals. Okay? How did they know it was going to be cold? I, I mean, how did they know any of these things? I, I think about stuff like that. All right? So, you know, okay. Now, I, I understand the, the, the mechanics of building a bridge. But how do they put the weight sign on there? No. So like two pounds over, it's going to collapse. <laughs> well, then should it be two pounds more if it's not? <laughs> See, I think about those things. All right? But God a lot of times uses those. All of a sudden I find myself thinking about something that I wasn't thinking about before. And it's, oh, yeah, God, what about this? And, and sometimes it's for some of you guys, sometimes it's for other people, sometimes it's just things that really I don't see what it has any bearing on anything in this life, but God drops it into my heart and I just talk with him about it. We just converse, we talk, okay? Um, you know, some of you guys, when you pray, man, it's like somebody unrolled parchment and wrote in gold letters. I got a loose leaf notebook with papers everywhere and scribblings. <laughs> But God understands that, because that's me. Okay? So prayer. Building up the body. Next pillar. Building up the body through transparency and accountability. Okay? I'm not going to go into this a whole lot, but the book of Corinthians. The book of Corinthians. Look at the issues that Paul was dealing with in his letters to the Corinthians. Pride, lack of discipline, um, litigation among the saints, uh, lack of purity. All of these things were going on in the church. And Paul had to address those. This is what I'm talking about. Paul had to know about them in order to address them. Okay? Okay? I think this all goes back to the Garden of Eden, this, this whole mentality. Because see, when Adam and Eve first realized that they had sinned, what was the first thing they did? They covered themselves. And boy, that thing has not changed from then to now. We just cover ourselves differently. We put those big old masks up in front. Boom. You know, the smiley face and everything's great and everything's wonderful. Nothing's going on. Everything's perfect in my life. I am sinless. Okay? And that's not true, is it? It's not true. How often do we struggle with our sins alone? <clears throat> All the time. But if we were transparent, <clears throat> we run the risk of somebody hurting us. You betcha. We also run the risk of God doing something miraculous. Okay? God didn't say it would be pain-free. He said it would be worth it. Okay? We're not in this for the short distance. We're in this for the long distance, all the way to the end. Okay? Um, James 5.15. Uh, James is speaking. He's wrapping up his letter. And he says, The prayer of faith will save the one that is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, okay, you want healing. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You get that? Now, we can pray generally. I know you're all struggling with sin. Every one of you. I don't know what kind of sin. And I'm not saying I need to know in every case what kind of sin. But I'll tell you what. If we confess our sins... Then we can share one another's burdens. We can pray for each other. Uh, Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay? Now, this caught in sin doesn't mean... 
I walked in, I opened the door, and I saw you doing something you shouldn't. I think it means you're snared, you're stuck, you're trapped in this sin. I can't get out, I don't know how to get out of this. Those who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But be careful. Don't get dragged into the sin. Dave Wilkerson, a man I have a, 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 a lot of admiration for, a lot of respect for. He got messed up. He was invited to be on a government panel looking into pornography. The effects on the actors and on the people and, and guess what happened? He got stuck. He got trapped. And it became a burden to him for a long, long time. Okay? Be careful so that you don't be tempted. Okay? If you're a recovering alcoholic, it's probably not a good idea for you to deal with someone that's drinking. Don't, don't get tempted. Now, God may use you. God may give you a strength to do that that I don't have. I've never had a problem with drinking. Mostly it all goes in my mouth. I don't like alcohol. But hey, if you like alcohol, if you can take, whew, if you can take that, you can have mine. I don't want it. All right? So that's not a temptation for me. I look at people that struggle with alcoholism and I go, that's weird. Okay? People look at some of the struggles that I have, like a bad temper. Why would that make you mad? Why doesn't it make you mad? <laughs> okay? So we all struggle in certain areas, but we can't help each other. We can't bear one another's burdens as long as we keep hiding it behind the mask. Okay? Now, sometimes I think there needs to be confession in front of the church. Okay? That's, that's not easy because people can take things and bash you. But I don't think that's necessary all the time. I think sometimes it's sufficient to go to a brother or sister and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Would you pray with me? Would you help me with this? Would you help hold me accountable? Um, you know, I, I'm accountable to several of my sons because every one of us has struggled with pornography in our lives. Okay? It's a multi-generational thing. My grandfather was one of the early pornographers. Okay? He actually filmed it. Okay? It's a multi-generational sin. And we keep each other accountable. We talk to each other. When, when one of us is struggling, we send a note out, please pray for me, I'm struggling. Nothing more needs to be said. Praying. Praying. Got it. Okay? Be accountable. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanks, thankfulness in your heart to God. Colossians 3.16. This is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We, we teach each other and admonish one another in wisdom. Okay? Now, all of this, all of these things, this is kind of, you know, we've got pillar, 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 pillar. This is the thing that holds all of this together. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all that you do be done in love. Okay? That's what's got to be driving you. When, when you are helping somebody deal with their sin, they don't need your judgment. They might need your correction, but they don't need you standing on your high horse looking down your nose at them. They need you to get off the horse and help them back up to their feet. Okay? Do you love them enough to get off your horse and help them up? Do you love them enough to teach them? Do you love them enough to pray for them? Do you love God enough to do these things? To, to worship Him? To fellowship with His saints? To be different than the world? All of this is to be done in love. So, so now we've got the insights. What do we do with this? Go. Go. Go, go, go. Out. Take everything that you get here and apply it out there. Take the light. Whether at this point in your walk you have a little pen light or whether you've got one of those blinding, stupid, police are going to kill you light. Okay? Whatever light you have, shine it out there. Let it be seen. Let it be known. 
Don't let anyone have to guess where you are in relationship to this world. Whose are you? Let them know. Yeah, you know what? I, I don't find those jokes funny. I, I think they're dishonoring. I think it dishonors God, and I think it dishonors His creation. Okay? Then, let it just flow out of you. Let it fill you up. Don't put a cork in it. Don't put a stopper. Let it bubble out. Okay? You would be amazed at the things that people pick up on what you do. That, that really, that blessed you? That's weird. Okay? God knows what he's doing. Trust him. <coughs> so goats come in, sheep go out. We got to go out there. We got to bring them back in here. The question that you have on your paper. Okay, I asked you. Write your answers down. Now I'm going to ask you a second question. What are you willing to do about it? Oh, wait a minute. I thought you were going to tell me you were going to fix it. I am. I'm telling you. You're going to fix it. What do you need to do to correct this problem? Okay? Some of you, it might be a personal thing. You know, hey, I'm, I'm just not a really good speaker. I get embarrassed. I get flustered. Some of you, the pastor talks way too long. Okay? Well, I don't know how you're going to fix that. I guess you could get up and walk out, hold a sign. And it is time. Okay? Take the light out there. Shine it. Bring the goats in. Let God miraculously transform them from a goat to a sheep. He moves them from the left hand to the right hand. Okay? They join in fellowship, just as we are in fellowship. Okay? And then we train them up that they too can go out. So that we continue to reproduce, continually building this cycle over and over and over again. Okay? I heard a stat. I, I don't know if this was just a pastor speaking. I did not look it up. I don't know where he got his information. But the, but the number is between 90 and 95% of Christians never lead another person to the Lord. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm a waterer. I'm not a harvester. No, you're a coward. I know sometimes I'm a coward. God tells me to go talk to someone. I'm like, I don't want to talk to them. God, they look scary. God never had me talk to the ones that look all peaceful and calm. He had me talk to the ones that, that look like they have problems in their lives. God's plan for this church. He wants more from us than we're giving him. We have got to be a body that takes what he gives us here. And I'll tell you, God has gifted us with some incredible people in this body. I mean, we've, we've got a, an incredible worship leading team. Amen. I mean, last week, all of the women on our worship team were up at the retreat doing worship. And we still had a full crew up in the front, all men, leading worship. Uh, that, that's incredible. That's a, that, uh, an incredible. We have teachers in here that are, have just got incredible insight into the Word of God. We have servants in here that are going out of their way to serve. This is an incredible, incredible fellowship. Why would we not want people to come in and be a part of this? Oh, they might ruin it. Yeah, that's the risk we run. But I tell you what, if we love them enough, sooner or later, they are going to come around. Okay? Trust God. He knows what He's doing. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you today for this body, this family that you have put together. I thank you, God, for the sweet spirit that is here. I thank you, Father, for your protection over us. That, Father, you keep the wolves away. I ask, Lord God, that you would continue to make us wise. Father, that we would be champion runners pressing in hard that we would win the prize. Father, that we would discipline ourselves so that we might win the prize. Father, that we would be a people that are not afraid to take your light into the world. Help us, Father, to be faithful in carrying out the message 
that you have given to us, this message of reconciliation, that we can be redeemed, that we can be taken out of all of the mess. We can be clean, we can be washed, we can be made new and presented spotless before you. I ask, Lord God, that you would give us courage to do those things that, Father, make us tremble. Whether it be witnessing out on the street, Father, witnessing to our co-workers, Father, dealing with the issues of sin that are plaguing us, give us courage. Help us, Father, to be motivated by love. That, Father, we would indeed have about us the spirit of gentleness. Thank you, Father. We honor you today for all that you've done, all that you are doing, and all that you have promised and is yet to be fulfilled. In Jesus' name, amen.